Um, <clears throat> I'll, um, you know, we've been doing these webinars for what, a couple of months now, and um, we're just so thankful to have Dr. Christian Messimer. Um, he's a certified financial planner, uh, lead us in these calls and just provide insight and wisdom as far as how to manage our finances. Um, so we're just very grateful and uh, lucky and blessed to have him. And uh, I know if you have questions, feel free to, I think the chat box is there, feel free to type them in the chat or you can just, you know, it's pretty open, open forum. So as we go along, if you have a question, just let Christian know and he'd be happy to answer it. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass along to, to Christian to get started. Fantastic. I'm going to share my screen. Just let me know if that kind of came through. Everything coming through? I'm hoping. It's loading. There you go. Okay. Very good. So good morning. It's great to be with you guys again this morning. And that, again, thank you, Tammy and the Center for Financial Health for having me. Uh, this is my company, Church Steward Tips, which uh, came out of my passion for stewardship in the local church. Uh, my company's purpose is to equip the people of God to do the will of God through the gifts of God. So, so pretty simple, but I've got a huge passion for pastors, a huge passion for trying to make sure that you guys are, are doing well this side of retirement. And then next side is what we'll get into. You know, I don't, I don't like to toot my own horn. This just kind of lets you know, I'm at least qualified to speak on the topic of uh, retirement planning today. So today's agenda is going to be real simple. Uh, we're going to spend about 20 minutes. I want to talk about retirement planning basics. Then I'm going to open it up for questions. We can go questions on any topic for about 15 minutes. Uh, you know, if you want to stay on point, you know, we can stay on retirement. But a lot of guys kind of tune in on occasion and they've got some other questions that, you know, maybe they, maybe they uh, caught, a, talk, caught the life insurance one a couple weeks ago or the uh, we've done we've done quite a few uh, savings retirement. We've done one on pastoral comp. So, you know, if you've got questions that are not related to this, it's okay. This is a free form for you guys. So, you know, just feel free to kind of ask, ask as, as you want. Today is our fourth uh, stewardship talk, if you will. Uh, today's topic is going to be retirement planning basics. So there's lots of different questions when it comes to retirement planning. How much do I need to save? How much do I need to save each month? How much is enough? These are all questions that when I'm sitting down with pastors, I hear quite often, yet foundational, you know, the, as, as, as far as foundational, all these questions, it's all going to be the same. And it all comes down to retirement planning is all about income replacement. So that's kind of what I want you guys to think through today. It's all about income replacement. So if you're dealing with retirement planning, the question you've got to answer is from where will the money I need in the future come? From where will the money I need in the future come? That's what we're focused on today. So the average retiree, if you kind of look out there for statistics, needs to replace somewhere around 75% of his or her pre-retirement income once they hit retirement. So if you're a pastor and you're currently bringing in roughly $60,000 to run the house, chances are in retirement, you're going to need right about $45,000. And the question I hear right off the bat from a lot of folks is, why the drop off? Why do I have this 25% drop off? Why does it go from 100% of what I, what I was making to 75? And there's a myriad of reasons, but I want to focus on the top two. First, by the time you get to retirement, hopefully, and again, hopefully, the big debts that you have, particularly your mortgage, mm -hmm. but some other stuff, your cars, your student loans, all that, you know, when you're thinking about retirement, you're thinking, 66, 67, 68, all those big debts are gone. And even if you were to buy a home in your mid-30s and had a 30-year mortgage, by 65, 67, you've got it completely paid off. So the fact that your mortgage is gone, that's going to lead to a big, a substantial drop as far as kind of what you're going to need every month to, uh, to take care of your bills. <clears throat> Secondly, and I hope this is kind of the same for, for uh, everybody who's listening, when you get to retirement, you have saved for your entire career. Now you don't need to save anymore. Now it's time. So you've accumulated from the time you got out of uh, got out of school and took that pastor or took that job, and you're accumulating, 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 accumulating. And now you're in retirement, and now it's about preserving and, and using. 
It's no longer about saving, right? So you're no longer directing funds to savings for retirement, and that's going to free up some cash flow. So that's usually why we see that drop. The big debts are gone, and the big amounts that you're saving for retirement are gone. So your retirement income needs might be more or less, right? 75% is just a, a number that, uh, that we usually kind of tell people you need to kind of replace. Only you know your specific situation. However, if you're a younger pastor listening to this, plan for about 75% of that income replacement. So now that you know how much you need to replace in retirement, now we can start building a plan, right? So let's kind of, well, let's kind of look through that. I want you to think of your income plan as a three-legged stool. And each leg is going to provide some stability for you. Social Security is going to be your first leg. And Social Security is, is going to be the, the option that, uh, that hopefully most of you are paying into. I know, you know, it used to be it was really popular for pastors to opt out of Social Security. Uh, if you listen to Guidestone and even like the executive committee of the SBC, and I know that the ERLC has done some articles, uh, pretty much all of those groups across the board now are begging, pleading, uh, trying to drag pastors to stay in Social Security, not opt out. So Social, Secu so Social Security is going to provide this set income stream for life. The downside is that that income stream will income stream will disappear when you die. So if you've got Social Security and your wife is on maybe half of your Social Security, when you die, that stream passes away. Or when she dies, that stream passes away. So it's, it's only going to be good for as long as the person's alive. But at least it's one income stream. The second leg is personal savings. This is predominantly going to come through you guys putting money in your 403B, maybe putting money in an IRA, or just maybe putting money in maybe an after-tax brokerage account or a savings account. But real simple, this is this is 100% on you. You're going to put all, all your money in there. You're going to save. And what's going to be in there at the end is going to be a, uh, you know, the result of how much you have saved and how aggressively you have invested and how the market's done over time. And this last, this last leg is what I call income. It's kind of a catch-all. So, you know, if you've got Social Security is one leg, you've got personal savings is another. What I call income is going to be it's going to have various different di different pieces going to fit into it. Uh, number one piece could be pensions. So some some folks that we know might have served in the military for 20 years before they retired and went to the pastor. So you might have a pension from the military. You might be a teacher. You might have worked for state, federal, or local government. All of those options kind of have a pension system set up where you once you retire, you will receive a set amount of income for the rest of your life. So that's number one. Number two, I know plenty of pastors and just plenty of people in general who buy uh, real estate. You know, they might buy an apartment or, or a house to rent or a duplex or something like that. And that brings in additional income, right? So that additional income in retirement could be used to support some of your retirement. And then most of the pastors that I'm talking to, they might retire from full-time ministry, but they're never going to retire from preaching the word, right? So that income might be, hey, if maybe you're not maybe you're not in a full time capacity anymore, or maybe you, you're uh, leaving a larger church position and taking a smaller country church where you know that your uh, your gifts can be used. But maybe it's taking a smaller church with a, salt, a smaller salary. Maybe it's pulpit supply. Uh, you know, maybe it's just people having you having you uh, come in and do weddings and funerals because you were the, their pastor for years and years and years. So that's kind of the additional income that might come in. One caveat that I want to bring up as you kind of look at these different legs that we're talking about is that the bulk of the responsibility for your retirement is on you. So this is why prioritizing savings is foundational for creating a strong retirement plan. So I just want you to kind of remember that as we're walking through. All of these legs are dependent on you. Leg one is dependent on you staying in Social Security when you have the option to opt out. Leg two is for you foregoing immediate gratification and savings in the long term. And leg three, you know, that might be taking advantage of some opportunities that you might not have thought about before. So most of these are going to fall on you. So I just kind of, you know, I always try to tell people, listen, your retirement is going to be from an income standpoint is going to be as good as you are willing to sacrifice in the short term. Right. Because, you know, what I want you to do is I want you to, I, I do want you to have a great 
pastoral career up into 65, 67. But then you're going to have another 20 to 25, maybe 30 years in retirement. So we've got a plan for that as well. What does an income plan look like and how does this help us understand how much income you're going to need into retirement? Well, that's kind of what we're going to deal with the next slide. So really what we're trying to figure out is how much do you need? Question mark, right? So if you're going to calculate how much you need, we're just going to start with, hey, we just talked about your uh, roughly needing 75% of kind of your current income, right? Maybe it's your peak income, whatever it is. So you're going to start that. That's, that's kind of what I'm going to start with, my retirement need. So if it's 60000 uh, you know, and I need 75%, maybe it's going to be that 45000 Or, you know, may, maybe, it's, uh, maybe I do need 60000 because it's more. Then I'm going to subtract what I'm going to bring in by Social Security, right? So if you're curious, you can go to ssa.gov, create an account, and you can go in there and that, that'll give you the opportunity to kind of see what your Social Security will look like at taking it at different ages, maybe 62, full retirement age would be 66 or 67, and then age seven. So that's kind of, that's your, that's your next option. Thereafter, I, I want you to calculate your other income. Now, remember other income, that might be pension, that might be rental, that might be post-retirement income, whatever that might be. So we're going to take what we think we're going to need in retirement. We're going to subtract the two variables that we, that we can kind of guess, and that's going to tell us how much we're going to have to make up for in retirement. So let's just take this for kind of an example. Let's say that I know that I'm going to need $65,000 to live on. That might be high for you. That might be low for you. I don't know. But, you know, we're just going to do this to make the math, the math easy. So I'm going to need $65,000. My Social Security is going to bring in roughly thirty. dollars Might be more, might be less. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to guess that if I do pulpit supply or I'm working part-time at a, at a local church or something like that, maybe that brings another $5,000. So when I take what I need and I subtract what, I, what I'm going to bring in, now I've got $30,000 that I've got to come up with, right? So now I know my income shortfall. So why does that matter? Because if I know my income shortfall, I can tell you roughly how much you're going to need in retirement assets. So let me kind of illustrate that for you. So, you know, if you remember in the last, in the last box, and I'll kind of show it, how much do I need question mark, right? Look at this transition. How much do I need exclamation point, right? So this one ends with an exclamation point. The reason for the shift is that far too often people underestimate just how much they're going to need in retirement to make up for that shortfall. So, you know, I don't want to take a formal poll, but I want you guys to write down how much you think you will need in your account to make up for $30,000 a year throughout your retirement. So just, just, just write it down on a piece of paper. And if you, want to, if you want to be bold and kind of lift it up to the, to the camera, that's great. If not, that's fine. And then, then you know, this is – so that, that's kind of the guess. So write down the number you think you're going to need in that retirement account. And now I want you to look at what you, what you should have based on that 30000 okay? So for that 30000 this is what you're going to need. And usually this is the point where somebody's jaw hits the floor because they say, Christian, this is a lot – of money. Why in the world do I need this much in my retirement account? And the answer is really simple. The answer is I don't want you to run out of money in retirement. So there are two investment dangers when you get into retirement. Number one is investment risk. And that's all predicated on what the market does, right? So think back over your life so far. And you know, most of you guys are a little bit older than me, but I remember the crash in the early 2000s with the dot com bubble right? I was just getting into the, into the financial services industry then. And then I remember the crash in 2007 and 2008. That was another substantial crash. Then we had a crash, a little bit of one in 16. And then we had one in, at the very beginning of 2020 with the pandemic. So each time, you know, basically what happens if your account goes down and you've got to start drawing money out? So the account goes down and you start pulling money out. If that happens over a long period of time, guess what? You have, the, you have a high likelihood of running out of money. The second thing I want you to think through is longevity risk. And what do I mean by that? That just means outliving your money. So what happens if you guys plan to retire or to die by age 85? But because of medical breakthroughs and things like that, you live to 90. Well, if you run out of money at 85, 
your last five years are going to be pretty, pretty difficult, pretty sparse, right? You're either going to, you're either going to have to live pretty, pretty uh, low key, or you're going to have to be dependent on your kids. And pretty much the, the guys that I talk to and the ladies that I talk to, depending on the kids is not something that, that you guys want in your financial plan, right? So that's just kind of something for you guys to think through. You know, what, the reason I've got these numbers here, three, four, and 5%, to get $30,000 in income, if you withdrew 3%, you're going to need a million dollars in your account. If you withdrew 4% a year, you're going to need about $750,000 in your account. If you withdrew 5%, you're going to need about $600,000. Why, why is this 3 4 and 5% important? With almost 100% confidence, I can say if you withdraw 3% or less of your portfolio's value every year, you're not going to run out of money with nearly 100% confidence. But when you start to increase your withdrawal rate to 4 or 5%, that confidence level drops to 90 or 85%. You start taking out six, seven, eight percent. I can almost guarantee you're going to run out of money before you uh, before you die. So that's that's why that's why it's so important to put a bunch of money back, uh, especially when you're younger. And we'll kind of we'll kind of demonstrate that in a little bit to just kind of demonstrate. Hey, the earlier you start savings, the the easier it is to hit these numbers. The later you start your savings, the more difficult it is to hit those numbers. So now that you're thinking about savings, you know, and, and this is kind of the, the big question that I, when I'm sitting down with pastors, this is what I'm working through with them. The next big question is, okay, if I'm thinking about savings, where in the world do I find savings? Most of the pastors that I'm, that I'm talking to, they're cash strapped, right? I mean, that, that's, that's, that it's just part of, it's, it almost seems to be part of the plight of, I'd say most pastors through their first, 15 to 20 years of ministry. They're cash strapped. So what they're trying to do when they're reaching out is, hey, where in the world can I find some money? So the obvious place is to try to find, find a way to make room for it in your, in your budget. However, you know, most of the pastors that I work with, they've already got a lean budget. And with that lean budget or really lean budget, they've got no room for retirement savings. So if you're one of those pastors, you've got a really lean budget, Really, you've cut it down to pretty much bare bones. If that's the case, I, I want to give you some ideas on where you can kind of find some extra money to put to put towards savings and put towards retirement. Number one is tax tax refunds. Most of the pastors that I'm doing counseling with have some sort of tax refund at the end of the year. So I would strongly suggest that you start to get in the habit of saving that over spending that. Now, this is going to mean that you're going to have to come, you know, you're going to have to come to grips with that money is no longer going to be available when you file for your refund. So you're going to have to make some adjustments there financially. You know, a lot of pastors I know use their tax refund to pay down debt or things like that. They're going to have to reevaluate what's, what's going to be the important priority. Start putting that towards savings. Second is love offerings, right? So pastor appreciation month and Christmas, those are, those are oftentimes where there's extra margin for pastors. Their people are taking care of their pastor during that time. Direct those funds towards savings, right? You're not budgeting on those funds. You're not thinking about those funds. That's the gravy. So if, if you can get a really good budget together, use that gravy and help those funds now go towards retirement. Another one is honorariums. And all I mean by that is, you know, when you guys are preaching funerals, when you're doing weddings, when you're doing counseling, a lot of folks want to be generous as a result of your time. They want to thank you. And as a result of that thankfulness, you will get something that, you know, you know it's not part of your average budget. So take, take that money and start to put that towards retirement. And finally, just extra income. So sometimes, you know, unfortunately, you've got to pick up extra work. And the only thing I can tell you that, you know, regarding picking up extra work, and I know that there's a stigma for that, but I would much rather you pick up extra work and be able to put more money towards retirement now when you're able-bodied than in the future when, you're, when you might be short, but you don't have the strength or the health to work anymore. So do it now when you can. And again, you know, I understand a lot of you guys are cash strapped, right? The problem with being strapped is that you become today focused, present focused. And focusing on today kicks that savings can down the road and as you're going to see in a minute, when it comes to savings, you do not want to delay.
So the pastor shouldn't save alone for retirement. The church must assist. Now, let me, let me say that again. The church must assist. Now, this is, you know, this is a big passion of mine, is trying to get churches that are smaller, churches that usually have single pastors, churches that have tight budgets, to kind of work with their pastor to, to create really good compensation programs so their pastor's taken care of. And again, all I mean by taking care of is, hey, I want a pastor to be able to live, to eat, right? To have medical coverage and to save for retirement, just like every other person in their pew, right? I'm not asking you guys to be able to drive a brand new car every year or something like that. This is just, I want pastors to be taken care of by their church. And every church is going to have a different level to which they can take care of their pastor. But when it comes to retirement, the church needs to assist. So the first way a church can assist is provide a social security offset. Here, what a church is going to do is they're going to gross up a pastor's income by what the church would have paid into a pastor's social security had they not been a pastor. Because you guys know pastors are responsible 100% for their SECA taxes, right? Versus if you were just a church secretary, the church would pay half your FICA and you would be responsible for paying half the FICA. So I just kind of want you guys to, to think through that just as a church gross up my pastor's income to offset for that social security. This offset, if the churches go along with that, this savings could now be used for, uh, for retirement, right? And then for pastors that have opted out of social security, this offset, could that be used to do what? Put money towards retirement. Maybe they, opt, maybe they opted out of social security, that's great. You know, that's fine. We can work around that. We can now use that offset to save for retirement in an IRA or in a 403B. The second way a church can assist is to provide a straight retirement contribution. So this contribution is not pastor dependent. The church might contribute uh, a certain amount every year or a percentage of the pastor's salary. Or, you know, what they could do is at the end of the year, if the, if the year has been good for the church, they could do an extra contribution and take care of the pastor. It's real simple. However they want to structure that, guess what? That's the church's business. But these are ways churches can come alongside a pastor. The final option is an employer match or a church match. Here, the church matches based on what a pastor contributes. It could be 100% up to a certain percentage. In other words, pastor, if you put in 6%, guess what? We're going to put in 6%. Or pastor, if you put in 6%, we're going to put in 3%. The downside here is no pastor contribution, no church contribution. The upside is it forces the pastor to also be responsible for his or her uh, retirement. So, you know, you can have a combination of it. You could have a social security offset. You could have a flat amount that the church wants to contribute and you can have an, you can have an, a, a church match. There's, there's no limit to how, to how generous a church can be. But if you're a church out there and you wanna take care of your pastor, I would start with the social security offset. The second thing I would look at is a straight retirement contribution, help your, help your pastor out, especially if you know things are tight. And then the final thing would be an employer match and just kind of layer it up and take care of them over time as your funds permit. Now I want to kind of jump into some retirement dangers. So there are certain behaviors that I see that pose a danger to your retirement. The first is opting out of Social Security. And, you know, I know that this was really popular back in the day, but the reason why I dislike pastors opting out of Social Security, we could have a, uh, we could have a moral and theological argument on another time, but I just want to focus financially, is you're going to lose one big leg, right? That set income coming in every single month, that is a huge loss that you're going to lose. So number two, in addition, when people opt out of Social Security, they often forget that they are also opting out of Medicare. So not only do they lose that income stream, now when they get to retirement, they've got to figure out how in the world they're going to pay for medical coverage. So not only do you lose an income stream, now you pick up an expense. So at a time where you should be getting rid of expenses, we talked about that, getting rid of debt, getting rid of retirement savings, because that's no longer on, on your list of things. Man, now you're picking up another expense with medical. And let me tell you, medical when you're in your 60s and 70s is not, not going to be cheap, because that's normally when people are what? Using their medical insurance. So it's not going to be cheap for you. 
opting out of Social Security, I'm just going to call it like it is. It's a double win. You lose the income, you increase your expenses. That's a tough spot for a pastor. Number one, number two, parsonage. A parsonage is great when you are the pastor. However, at retirement, guess what? You are no longer the pastor. A new pastor is going to come in and move into that parsonage. And you're going to have to find new living accommodations. So, you know, when, when you got to look at what Americans have as their largest asset, it isn't their retirement savings. It's normally the value of their home. So if you are li if you've lived in a parsonage for your entire pastoral life and you haven't been saving what would be the equivalent of a mortgage payment and you haven't been putting money back or anything like that, when you leave that parsonage, again, we talked about trying to decrease expenses in retirement. Now you're going to have to find a new place to live. If you've got, an, if you've got to find an apartment, guess what? That's, that's a monthly expense you didn't have before. What's another thing? If you buy a house, now you got a mortgage and property taxes. Guess what? That's an expense you didn't have before. So I just want you to think through, if you've got a parsonage now, Pastor, try to figure out you know, what you can afford and start saving based on what you're saving uh, based on that parsonage. So if that parsonage might be worth $800 a month, try to put that in your budget and save $800 a month. So work towards that and save as much as you can because there's going to be a day when that parsonage is going to disappear. We covered a high spending rate in retirement earlier. You know, whatever's in that account, you shouldn't spend more than at max 5%. And the only thing I want you to take away here is the higher you spend, the higher your likelihood of running out of money. That's going to be a key, a key thing for you to remember. The higher you spend in retirement, or the greater the, your percentage you're taking out of that, that account, the higher the likelihood you're going to run out of money in retirement. Keep it to 3 and 4%, you should be good to go. Finally, not prioritizing saving early in your career. And, you know, this is such an important fact and, and, and kind of danger that I, that I see with pastors. I give it an entire slide. So starting early makes a really, really big difference. So let me kind of walk you through kind of what I'm getting at. So earlier we talked about, hey, I need $30,000 out of my account every year. So what numbers did we use? We used a million, we used 750,000, and we used 600,000. So I'm keeping the exact same numbers so that if you guys are looking for a template, this is a template you guys can work on, right? And again, uh, this PowerPoint slide and the video, Tammy's going to make available to all the pastors at the end. So, so I see some of y'all snapping photos. Feel free to snap photos. Make sure you got it. But at the same time, remember, I don't hide anything from y'all. These, these meetings are to benefit you. So this presentation, I'm not going to go and tuck it away as some like intellectual property. All I'm going to work on next is getting that to Tammy so she can get it to you. But what I want you to pay attention to right here is this, is the, are these numbers right here. If you started at 25 and worked to age 66, which is kind of 66 and 10 months, 67, 67 and two months, that's roughly what, where, what you're looking at for retirement you'd be able to work for roughly 41 years. If you started uh, 10 years later contributing, now you're contributing at 31 years. If you started 20 years later, now you're only contributing for 20 years. Now, the problem that I usually see with pastors and just Americans in general is that they're not focused on retirement until here, which doesn't give you a whole lot of time. So let's just look at what it takes. Assuming an 8% rate of return, what is it gonna take monthly for you to hit these numbers, assuming 8%. Well, if you're starting early, straight out of seminary, straight out of school, and you're putting money in your retirement account, look at how, look at how little, in the grand scheme of things, you, you've got to save every month to hit these numbers. And again, 8% is not a huge, a huge ask over your lifetime. $250, $200, $158. That's manageable, right? But then what happens if we kick the can down the road 10 years? If we kick the can down the road 10 years, we're going to lose well over 130 drops in the bucket. So now, we, now we're still dealing with 31 years, so we got a pretty good chunk of time that we're working through. However, what happens? Man, that jumped quite a bit now from 264 to 614. That's huge. 198 to 462. That's huge. And 158 to 368. Again, delaying, what's, what's that going to do? Delaying 
is going to mean that you're going to have to put more money later, right? So you, if you're going to hit those goals, you're going to have to pay the piper. So you either pay the piper early and make that part of the way you live, or you're going to really pay the piper late, okay? Now, most people, this is about the time they're saving for retirement. These numbers right here. Now look at what you need, 45 to 66. And this is assuming you start at 45. If you started at 60, you're going to need a whole lot more. But I'm just assuming you start at 45. Now it's $1,500 a month to hit that million-dollar mark. It's $1,100 a month to hit $750. And it's going to be almost $1,000 a month to hit that $600. And then finally, this is the scary part. You and I both know that no pastor is going to hit these numbers if you wait to the very end of your career to start savings. $5,000 a month? I don't, I, most of the pastors I'm dealing with aren't making five, aren't making five thousand a month, much less being able to save five thousand a month, right? Thirty five hundred or twenty eight hundred. So as you, you know, the 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 big thing is that I want you to understand. If there's one major idea from this chart, you cannot afford to delay. A tiny bit in your early years can make a substantial difference over time. And if you kick that can down the road, you might not have the money to hit those numbers that you're going to need. And if you don't hit those numbers and you've got to take out 30,000, what happens if you've got, let's just say 300,000 in that account and you need 30,000? Well, now that's 10% of your account balance. What did we just talk about? What's the likelihood of you running out of money? It's pretty high. So that's why all of these different components we talked about all feed and form together. So, you know, some of you guys listening today, as always, uh, you know you need help on the financial side. Guess what? The BGCT, they've got you covered. So there's lots of resources for you. Number one, the Center for Ministerial Health. They've got financial literacy counseling. They've got a health grant, and they've got a health loan. If you want more information about that, reach out to Tammy. Number two, like on the counseling side, that's what I do. Tammy will tell you, I counsel with pastors all the time. I come alongside them. We walk on, we work on budgeting and, and what I call early on, we work on what I call financial triage. I'm going to find all the problems that you have going on, just like when you walk into an ER and we're going to start fixing those. And then once we get those fixed, we're going to work on all these long-term goals, right? So, you know, if you're a pastor, you know, you need some help, reach out to Tammy. She's got a slew of folks just like me that are ready to reach out and then help our pastors wherever you are. And the beautiful thing is in the state of Texas, you know, we're doing all of this on a Zoom. So, you know, maybe there's somebody close and local to you. And if not, you can jump on a Zoom call and it's pretty easy. If you're looking for some resources, uh, check, check out my page on Facebook, you know, give it a like. I drop the videos that Tammy records and I'm, I'm, starting, to, I'm starting to build other curriculum uh, for my pastors out there just to kind of keep them up to date on some financial stuff. And then hopefully, you know, as, as time goes on, I'm uh, building stewardship curriculum that you can bring into your local church. So, because it's not just about making sure that our pastors are taken care of financially. The reason a lot of churches are struggling is because our people are not taken care of financially. So, and, and, and they're making the same, the same difficult choices. So if we can fix what's going on in the pews, we can fix what's going on in the pulpit. If we fix what's going on in the pulpit, we can fix what's going on in the pews, right? It's all correlated. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's who I am, and that's, that's what I love to do. So with that, I'll kind of leave it open and, uh, you know, peg me with the questions, gentlemen and ladies. See. Ready for questions. Okay, I have a question. Hit me. I, I heard or read somewhere that typically you can, if you the right investment, you can double your money. I think it is in seven years. Is that right? Well, uh, it's it's called the rule of seventy two. So if you take if you take the the uh, the number seventy two, and you divide it by a particular rate of return, in this particular case, eight percent. That's how long it would take to double your money. So 72 oh. divided by eight would say that you would double your money every nine years. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And that's just kind of roughly off the, you know, if you were kind of do something off the cuff, uh, you know, that that's an easy way to kind of figure that out. Okay. So are there um, investments out there that you would recommend if somebody was trying to double their money in a particular way? I know you stock market real estate, but. Well, I mean, my, my expertise, I'll be honest, my expertise is not real estate. That was, that's not what I've ever done. I've always been on the investment side. Okay. And what, and what I, what I usually tell people is, you know, you've got to, the danger for a lot of people is they're approaching retirement and they realize that they are coming up short is to become overly aggressive hmm. and to be a lot more aggressive than they should be given their age. So hmm. basically kind of what happens is when you're early on, in your life, you can be aggressive. Why? Because you've got, as I showed um, you, 40 some odd years. So mm -hmm. if you're 25, I don't care what the market does today. You know, I'm 40. I don't care what it does today. I'm mm -hmm. going to keep putting money in it. Mm -hmm. When I'm 60 and, I, and I'm looking at retirement in five years, guess what? I care a lot what the market does. Because if we have another 2008 and the market's down 50 plus percent, it's going to take time for my account to grow back out. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the danger. So, you know, there are some rules of thumb that we used to use just from, uh, just from an investment standpoint. If you take the hundred, the, the number 120 and you subtract your age, that should tell you roughly how much you should have in stocks. Mm. So if you're, if you're, uh, if you're 60 and so you take 120 and you subtract 60, that gives you 60. So the max you should be in stocks is 60. And as you can kind of see, as, as that number gets bigger that you're subtracting every year, it's telling you that as you get older, what happens? You've got less and less money in stocks. Why? Yeah. Because you can't handle the volatility in your portfolio. Because when you're retired, what's in that portfolio is important because you're drawing down. Mm -hmm. When you're working, it's not important because you're accumulating. I don't care what, the, what my account looks like today. I care, I care what my account looks like when I hit 60 or 65, not at 40. So, th so that's kind of the way I would look at it. Now, you know, as, as far as investments kind of broadly, I like mutual funds over individual stocks because individual stocks can have a bad quarter and can go bankrupt, you know? And, you know, there are times for individual stocks. I mean, people love Apple and Facebook and Tesla. I get that, but, you know, I also grew up, you know, I got into the, into the industry when the great companies out there were Enron and yeah. MCI WorldCom and Dynergy. They're all gone. They're all gone. And they were supposed to be the greatest investments since sliced bread back then. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them had corporate, you know, corporate yeah. malfeasance. And then mm -hmm. they were gone the next day. So they were, they were high, high flyers. And the next day they were poof, gone. Billions of dollars evaporated. With a mutual fund, you've at least got, you know, hopefully at least 20 to 30 stocks in there. Okay. That, would, that wouldn't be a bad decision. You know, if you're like index funds, you could do something like the S&P 500. That would, that would be an index that follows the 500 largest uh, stocks in the U.S. That would be good, you know, that you're really diversified. You might want to do some international, international components in there because mm -hmm. remember, the U.S. isn't the be-all, end-all. We are pretty good, but you know, there are lots of great international companies out there. Yeah. And then when you're starting to look at, you know, security. So, you know, Pastor Baker, you're, you're a little older, you know, you've got to have, you know, if you take that 120 minus your, minus your age, maybe you've got 30 or 40% in, in bond or, you know, 30, 30 or 40% in other. Well, I mean, that might be bonds or cash. Uh, but again, what, what you want is to, to make sure that, that portion is the portion that's not gonna, gonna be real volatile with the, with the market goes up and down. That's gonna be the place where you can go and you know you can draw out that money in the short yeah. term if the, if, the, uh, if the stock market's up and down and your account's kind of, your account in the stock market is bouncing. Okay. You, uh, I've talked to some pastors who, they, they retired, they're older than me, but they love Godstone. They said Godstone did very good for them over the years. That's still a, and they, put their money and let it them diversified in mutual funds and all of that. You still like Gaston? I think as long as you can find somebody reputable 
who you know isn't going to swindle you, mm-hmm. that's a good start, right? The uh, the difficulty nowadays is finding good is finding good advisors who have your needs in front of their own. And Guidestone, by its very DNA, does that. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then lastly, because somebody else might want to question this, a lot of people, the buzzword is what, cryptocurrency and all of that. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, there's, there's a bunch of people, who, there's a bunch of people who, who are into cryptocurrency. I know nothing about cryptocurrency, yeah. absolutely nothing. My brother-in-law, I mean, he got in early on that, you know, he's done particularly well. Uh, he, he used to tell me, Chris, you got you to gotta, you gotta look at this. This is like the new, I don't know. I don't know if it's the the new the new the new kind of era that we're coming into. I don't know if it's the next Enron and it's just going to be a giant blow up, right? Yeah. Uh, I know, right? I know that there over time there have been lots of fads. There's been lots of fads in the financial services arena. There's just been lots of fads in general, right? Mm. I remember when people used to used to buy Beanie Babies because they thought that they were going to retire off Beanie Babies. Remember mm-hmm. that? You know, that was a fad back in the 90s, yeah. uh, you know, and now you go to a uh, you go to a yard sale and all you see is the Beanie Babies everybody invested in, you know, years and years ago. I don't know what crypto is going to do long term. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dave Ramsey, the last time I heard him say something about it, he said he was staying away from it right now. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think the uh, the issue is there's not just one. There's there's a multitude of cryptocurrency out there. I think the thing that I do like with all crypto is I like blockchain and what blockchain is going to do for security and what blockchain blockchain does for, uh, you know, just keeping things private and safe. Uh, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity in blockchain. I don't know about the individual cryptocurrencies. I think right now it's a fad. uh, And I, you know, I'd like to see what happens over a, uh, you know, five or 10 year period, you Mm -hmm. know, Thank but you. if you're if you're looking to get rich quick, you know just just remember, uh, you know we've seen we've seen Bitcoin go up to you know sixty plus thousand, but it wasn't too long ago that it went up to like eight or nine and then cratered down to three. Right. So you know if you bought it at eight or nine and it cratered down to three, you're feeling pretty bad, right? Mm. Eight or nine thousand. So you know it's all about when you get in and how long you can hold it. So that's the that's you know that's the time frame. So you know Pastor Baker, if you can if if you said hey you know I really like cryptocurrency. Can you hold it for the long term or is this a short term fix? That's going to be the danger for you. If you mm. need to get out quick and you're, you're getting out and it dropped tr- uh, tremendously, then you're kind of in trouble. Yeah. No. Thank you. Really good questions. Anyone else have any questions for Christian? Um, I think one question I wanted to ask is, like, what about HSAs? Do you recommend those as kind of another savings tool for retirement or how, how do you? I'm a huge fan of the HSA, a huge fan. Uh, for those of you who don't know what an HSA, it's a healthcare savings account. It affords you the opportunity to take pre-tax dollars. So you take money out pre-tax. It goes into an account that you can then use for medical expenses. I'm a big fan of that, but I'm a big fan of that after you've got your retirement savings going on. Now, you know, if you've got medical issues right now and you have access to an HSA and you know you spend maybe two or three thousand dollars a year on medical expenses, yeah, put two or three thousand dollars into the HSA. But you know, I, I work with some folks, you know, and again, I'm a financial planner by background. So it's not uncommon for me to, to work with somebody who's near retirement uh, on a financial planning, non-pastor related, and they might come to me and they've got hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars in their HSA because they've been maxing it out for 20 years. And you know, they didn't have really, really big medical expenses and then they kind of invested it conservatively. So from an HSA standpoint, yeah, put money in the HSA if you know you're going to spend it that year because it's 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 going to be your money long term. But don't max out the HSA at the expense of your retirement. So in the short term, make sure that the that you know if you're gonna if you're gonna have Let's say you know you're having surgery and it's going to cost you 2000 out of pocket. Put that money in the HSA. And then once you pay those bills, you can get reimbursed. That's easy. You just save money on taxes. That's, that's a real big win. But don't go and try to put as much money in the HSA as possible when you're not maxing out your retirement. So mm-hmm. priority should be 
yeah, put some money in the HSA if you know you've got medical bills, because at least then you're going to save tax dollars. Then devote every dollar you can to retirement. If you get to the point where you're maxing out retirement and you're looking for other options, then the HSA is a good one for you. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, well, um, yeah, we're gonna get this up on our webpage. I'm working on getting all of the, actually these up on our minutes or our Center for Financial Health webpage. And I know Christian will have the recording as well. <clears throat> and I'll email it out to you. This is part one of a two part series. So on May 18th, we're gonna have a Guidestone representative talk about um, the 403B, um, which is one of the retirement um, kind of tool or vehicles that is offered through Guidestone. Um, they're also going to be going over the church matching and protection benefit program, um, which is a, a program where you would get matching retirement contributions from the convention. Um, there's also a disability benefit and a term life benefit as well. So um, he'll be there to answer and they'll be there to answer any questions that you have about. Um, and also, if you're not familiar with Guidestone, uh, it'd be a good opportunity to get familiar with them and and ask any questions you might have. Um, so they're there to help and also help come up with some saving strategies, which Christian's already given some really great ones. So this will just be, um, just be, be available to augment what you just learned and provide you a, you know, direct um, conversation with the Guidestone folks um, to get familiar with them. And we'll be sending out the email uh, with the registration page for that. Um, in addition to that, we're also partnering with Guidestone to provide a landing page with information about the healthcare market. Um, we know that a lot of our pastors are on their own as far as health insurance goes, and that is a big part of your budget every month, um, keeping your families covered. So um, we want to make sure pastors are aware of all of the options. So, you know, there's Guidestone does offer plans as well as there's um, the, the marketplace plans, and there's also like, things like MediShare, that type of thing. So they'll cover, there's a, a landing page that will have a video covering all the different options um, as well, just to give you some more information and to uh, hopefully help you make uh, the best informed decisions as far as your healthcare coverage for your families. So that will be coming out soon as well. I want to thank you all today. Um, Pastor uh, Baker, do you want to pray us out, please? Yes. Father God, we thank you for these resources that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the servants that continually bring it. We pray that you'll continue to bless both of them, bless the pastors that's on this call. And Lord, as we get ready to leave your this place, never let us leave your presence. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks for your Thank time. You. Thanks for having yeah. us. Oh, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.